And um, I'm, I welcome you to the webinar today. This is the Master Gardener Volunteer State webinar, and I'm so glad that you're here. And uh, we are halfway through our series today. Um, next month will be Dr. Gary Knox. Um, he will be presenting on Gardens of the Big Bend. So be sure to tune in on the 28th of July for that. Um, some of you may know that Dr. Knox is planning on retiring. So these are some of his last presentations with us in IFAS. So you may, may want to make sure you tune in for that because he's such a treasure uh, for us in the horticulture field. Remember that you want to limit the use of the chat box for asking questions for the speaker and not for side conversations. You can also use the question answer boxes as well. And if for some reason the chat box is aggravating you, you can turn it off, okay? Um, and I did want to remind you that the Master Gardener Conference is coming up. Um, it is on October 16th through 19th. And if you like what you hear today from Dr. Jarrett Daniels, he will be presenting as a keynote speaker for us as well. And he will be doing a book signing for his new book down there in October. So we're very excited about that too. But we're also going to be joined by Gary Bachman, um, Madeline Hooper from the PBS series Garden Fit and Tony Advent from Plant Delights Nursery. So that's going to be great. So today our presenter is Dr. Jarrett Daniels. He's associate professor in the UF IFAS Department of Entomology and Nematology. He's the past curator of the um, McGuire Center at the Museum of Natural History here in Gainesville, one of the premier um, butterfly and moth research um, facilities in the whole world. So we're um, blessed to have that treasure here in Florida, and I hope that you all get an opportunity to visit that as soon as you can. Um, Dr. Jarrett uh, Daniels' research really focuses on imperiled Lepidoptera, so moths and butterflies that are endangered or imperiled. Um, he um, works on their conservation and he um, tutle, uh, tutors and mentors the um, students, uh, his PhD students and graduate students, also postdocs as well um, on working on their conservation. So he has put together an amazing team to help save these butterflies across Florida and the world. He is also author of multiple books. So he's a, a fantastic writer and compiler of awesome information out there for you to learn from. So we have a treasure here in Gainesville and we're just so thrilled that we can um, have Dr. Daniels um, present to us today on um, Lepidoptera um, uh, conservation success stories and a little bit probably, I hope he's gonna talk about his pollination center that he has coming up. So Jarrett, we welcome you. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much, Wendy and Emily. I, I really look forward to today and really value any time I have with Master Gardeners. You, you all are such a wonderful community and we get so much out of having you being in uh, Florida and helping uh, educate the natural, educate the public about the natural world around us. So um, as Wendy said, I'm, um, I'm actually a professor of entomology and curator at the Florida Museum of Natural History. And and my work, as, as uh, Wendy mentioned, is, is predominantly on imperiled Lepidoptera, butterflies and moths, but increasingly on native insect pollinators and kind of working across a wide range of systems and communities. And today I'd like to just talk a little bit about some of the, the broader research and some of the areas in which um, we've had some successes and, and ways that all of you can help uh, conserve and uh, improve the resources and habitat uh, for pollinators, butterflies, bees, and, and other insects overall, because we, we certainly know that with global change and biodiversity loss right now, all these organisms really need help uh, increasingly, especially in the built environment where we, we have yards and neighborhoods and can make a, a real difference. Uh, but I, I do want to start just with a little bit of background about, about insects, and you all know how important insects are uh, across uh, the globe. There are a little over five and a half million estimated species of insects, and they're the most diverse um, organism or animal group within the animal kingdom. And they're particularly important because they deliver a wide range of really beneficial ecosystem services. So they're really key for functional biodiversity uh, in a wide range of systems from natural systems to agriculture and agro ecosystems. And of course they deliver things such as natural pest control, nutrient recycling, decomposition, food for wildlife. If you're a birder and you love having 
songbird it's in your yard the the dominant portion of their diet when they're nesting and feeding their young are of course lepidopter and larvae and other insects uh, and of course pollination is really a keystone service it's critically important for the functionality and productivity of both natural and human made systems. So it is such a key role and roles that insects play overall. If we drill down just into insect pollination, worldwide uh, about 87 and percent conservatively of all flowering plants on the planet and more than 75% of the 115 leading crop species are dependent on or at least benefit from animal pollination. And of course, we know that the bulk of this service is delivered by insects. And it's not just agricultural crops. It's the production of fruits and berries that birds and other wildlife feed, feed on. It's the production of seed for biofuel production. It's rich, diverse forage for ruminants such as cattle. Uh, you can make a strong argument that the diversity, uh, the floral and plant diversity that's resulting from insect pollination really is a driver of the pharmaceutical industry. And of course, it's kind of the backbone for the maintenance uh, and productivity and stability of natural systems, such as that tall grass prairie that you see in the lower portion of this slide. So the service of pollination cannot be undersold. It's critical for the world around us. And uh, it's also critical for the second largest industry in Florida, second only to tourism, and that is, of course, agriculture. And a good colleague of mine, Rachel Malinger in the Department of Entomology, uh, came out with this study uh, about a year or so ago, which really uh, put some really important numbers on the benefit of insect pollination to Florida-specific crops. And what she found really was that, you know, insect pollination is required for a great number of the specialty crops that we have in Florida. Really 43% of all the crops grown in Florida really benefit directly or require insect pollination. And this contributes significant dollars over time, not only to the most valuable crops such as blueberry squash and watermelon, but overall to the Florida economy and Florida agriculture contributing a little north of $1 billion annually. So that's a pretty significant uh, price tag when you talk about a service that is, is dominantly free. Obviously, uh, Western honeybees and bumblebees are uh, something that growers pay for, but a, a lot of that background service of pollination is delivered by a wide range of wild native pollinators from bees to flies to beetles to butterflies and moths. So it's a significant contribution to our state that has um, implications from jobs to the overall economy to food security and the pricing of food when you go to the grocery store. And of course, we know that uh, across the world of insects, these are kind of the major players when it comes to pollination. There are others, of course, but these are the dominant six groups that include butterflies, bees, which are kind of the heavy lifting crew because they uh, go uh, to blossoms not only for nectar, but to collect pollen for their developing brood, flies, which are woefully understudied, uh, beetles, moths, which again are, are understudied and serve as a, a great uh, significant contribution to both crop and wild um, plant pollination, especially as part of that nocturnal community. And then other insects that serve dual roles, such as natural pest control, as well as pollinators include uh, organisms such as wasps. So collectively, these are pretty productive and important insects to the natural world around us and to agro ecosystems. And if you look just at native bees, globally, there's about 20,000 species of bees, about 4,000 within North America, north of Mexico. And here in Florida, we have about six, uh, 316 species of bees uh, within the Sunshine State, of which about 27, 29 are fully endemic within the state. And this includes, uh, of course, the Western honeybee, but dominantly native bees, which are solitary and great majority of them are either ground nesters or twig nesters or cavity nesting species. And so these are wonderful organisms to invite into your landscape because they are not defending a hive. They are not social in the true context. So uh, they're fairly docile, they're incredibly productive, they're also incredibly diverse, both behaviorally, biologically, and in their appearance. So they're really a wonderful group of insects to have into your landscape and are generally quite harmful to humans. 
by comparison, there are over 18,000 species of butterflies worldwide, a little north of 750 uh, species within the United States, and about 190 species within Florida. And Florida being a subtropical or tropical state, that number is a little bit uh, nebulous just because of our proximity to the Caribbean uh, and the fact that we do get uh, periodic strays uh, or temporarily co temporary colonists in from Cuba and Hispaniola and uh, the islands of the Bahamas from time to time. And collectively, this, this broad range and diversity and richness of pollinators is really uh, key to the sustainability and resilience of systems, especially in an increasingly changing world due to habitat loss and fragmentation, the overuse of industrial and agricultural chemicals, climate change, all sorts of other threats and perturbations that we are throwing at the natural world. And there's a lot of research showing that the non-bee insect group collectively is really critical to productivity, especially in agricultural systems. And that this non-bee group actually does more floral visits than bees. So they're kind of, along with native bees, the safety net for uh, the natural world and agricultural systems if something continues to happen or declines continue to happen within the Western honeybee, uh, which uh, really isn't showing a tremendous amount of decline at this time. So they're really key to the resilience and sustainability of these systems, predominantly because they have so many different behaviors and life histories. So one threat may not uh, impact all these taxa uh, equally. So they really indeed are that, that safety net for all of our systems. So this would be essentially equivalent to having a very diverse stock portfolio and that can weather the changes within the economy, good and or bad uh, for the, the background of pollination, if you will. And of course, we also know that the natural world is changing and changing rapidly. We're in the middle of a biodiversity crisis and that all sorts of organisms and plants are declining. And of course, this uh, also impacts insects. And so there's a number of studies that, including several that have sh are shown here on this slide, that really indicate that insect populations, particularly in well-studied groups, such as Lepidoptera, butterflies and moths, and larger bees, such as bumblebees, are declining and declining quite precipitously. So it's upon us to craft ways and solutions to help reverse the decline of these really valuable organisms and uh, try to rebuild both forage resources and pollinator habitat across the wide range of landscapes in which we live and work uh, and occupy. So my real mantra for the last couple of years is the fact that if we're gonna be successful in not only reversing the decline of pollinator populations, but also connecting people to nature, we have to work uh, extensively across all landscapes because we are also aware of the fact that biodiversity is declining despite the fact that large parcels of land are being held under conservation. So this means now more than ever that these alternate or non-traditional spaces such as agroecosystems, transportation and utility corridors, and the built environment, which includes suburban yards and neighborhoods and urban green space are ever more important to rebuilding that forage resource uh, arena and ultimately providing habitat for these really important organisms and other wildlife that we have a role to play in all of these systems. They're all managed systems and we need to find out how to manage these systems more appropriately and sustainability and sustainably for the world around us. And through this effort, we can also connect a lot of people to the natural world around, which is also increasingly important because we are becoming uh, woefully disconnected to nature with the advent of technology and this our busy lives overall. So we can look at systems that are non-traditional such as agriculture. And this is a, a good place to start because we're ultimately using these as productive spaces to drive the service of pollination. But if you were to drive along or visit a, a specialty crop uh, field in Florida, such as this one for squash, you would look around the community, uh, the natural area around this farm, and there's not a lot of blooming resources. And so we're asking insects to come into this fairly hostile environment 
and provide an increased service of pollination without making it easy on them to do that. So one alternative approach might be to plant an array of herbaceous flowering plants within the crop itself or adjacent to the crop as pictured in this slide, which has a one acre augmented wildflower meadow in the foreground and the background is a working farm that's growing squash. And so in this model, this would serve as floral resources, providing nectar and pollen to draw in pollinating organisms from the surrounding environment and ultimately onto a target crop such as blueberry squash or watermelon as an example. And alongside that provide real habitat for pollinators, not only to provide resources, but nesting habitat as well. And in the research that we've done at the University of Florida, we've shown that this is a, indeed a viable model. And in this case, such augmented areas can provide uh, up to uh, north of 18 times as many bees uh, than the margins that do not have such augmented spaces that are just fallow and don't have a lot of resources. So if you plant it, they really will come. The downside, of course, is to this model is it takes land out of production. It draws insects into an environment where pesticides and herbicides are increasingly utilized that might have deleterious effects to insects. And also we don't fully understand really the best practices for establishing these plantings, how long they're viable within the system, and, and ultimately which species of plants are ultimately are most attractive to the insects we want to attract in the first place. But we also do know that in addition to just pollinating organisms, these rich floral enhancements provide habitat for and attract a wide range of other arthropods that can deliver additional ecosystem services such as natural pest control. And then these two studies that we've, uh, we've conducted at the University of Florida, these are rich environments for spiders and wasps and parasitoids uh, that can really provide a needed benefit to a target crop along with the service of pollination. So these can be really viable, diverse spaces that have tremendous benefit to a grower. Again, they do have their downsides, as I mentioned earlier. So we could look to alternate landscapes. And one of these being one of the most visible landscapes that we see on a daily basis. And that is a roadside. And I've always been fascinated with roadsides. I grew up in Wisconsin and roadsides were really a great place to go look for insects. They were also a great place to look for really diverse and often rare plant communities. And growing up in Wisconsin, this was a great place to look for tall grass prairie plants uh, along many rural roads because they were they had not been built upon and they were regularly managed through the process of mowing, which can mimic fire and help maintain those very floristically diverse communities. And when I came down to Florida, I, I again love roadsides because as you see pictured in this uh, image, these are really wonderful spaces that can be even more diverse than the adjacent natural lands that they're, they're bordering due to the fact that they are regularly managed by mowing. But there's a caveat to that and that mowing, if done properly can be beneficial, if done improperly might be deleterious. And so what is that sweet spot when it comes to management that ultimately ban benefits the floristic community as well as the insect community? So we worked on a project in collaboration with the Department of Transportation looking at evaluating three different mowing treatments every six, every three weeks, which was the norm in Alachua County, Florida, every six weeks, double that amount and a no mow regime entirely. And we looked at this across 12 roadway sections in North Florida, across multiple counties that bordered conservation lands. And then we went into these spaces and we monitored uh, and measured the floral diversity and also the bloom abundance and passively collected the flower visiting insects that were attracted to these particular roadway sections. And what we found is, is maybe not surprising that these are indeed very rich spaces for herbaceous flowering plants. We recorded 133 different species of flowering plants across 42 families in the roadways that we sampled. And even more importantly, a wide range of different flower visiting insects that were attracted to these spaces in 11 orders and 147 families. So really rich attraction for a mobile 
flower visiting insect community. But what's the biggest takeaway is the fact that we found that subtle changes in mowing practice had really profound effects, not only in maximizing the bloom abundance and thus the attractive value of these roadsides, but also in the uh, insect community that they attracted. So going from mowing every three weeks to a small change to every six weeks was equivalent to going to no mow entirely. So again, small recommendations for Department of Transportation to just tweak or reduce slightly their mowing frequency had really profound effects on enhancing that floral community, which has dividends also for motorists, meaning that these are more attractive, visible spaces when it comes to blooming colorful flowering plants, but it really maximized these spaces for flower visiting insects overall. And because roadways are long linear spaces, they bisect and run adjacent to so many other types of landscapes and can help act as movement corridors for these mobile organisms through an increasingly hostile matrix of urban development. So this is an alternative landscape that can provide real significant dividends to a wide range of adjacent landscape, including agriculture. And we also wanted to look at were these spaces really viable for providing resources and habitat for kind of charismatic keystone species like the North American monarch. And so we entered into another collaboration with the Department of Transportation to do roadside surveys looking for two species of milkweed, uh, Asclepias tuberosa, butterfly weed, and this one, this is pine woods milkweed, Asclepias humastrata, to see if indeed roadsides are good habitat and support robust populations of these plants that could have spillover effects for the conservation of the monarch butterfly. And what we found is that indeed roadsides are a, a tremendous resource when it comes to uh, monarch and milkweed populations. So in this picture, all the roadways that are highlighted in blue have high densities of those two milkweed species. The ones that are highlighted in red have ultra high density uh, populations of those uh, milkweed species. And as a result, they can provide really robust uh, resources for remigrating monarchs coming from Mexico and recolonizing Florida and supporting the regular breeding of monarchs during the summertime in uh, the state of Florida. They can also, because they have really high density populations, be a resource for seed production for restoration in more natural landscapes. And as you can see in the lower right-hand portion of this slide, they do indeed support a wide range of life stages for the monarch. So these are really viable habitats when it comes to benefiting the North American monarch right here in Florida. And we're also looking at new ways of using technology to monitor roadsides. So we have a pilot project under uh, going right now uh, with collaborators from Duke University to use, dr to use drones and deep machine learning to monitor these milkweed populations long-term along Florida roadways, uh, ultimately trying to determine whether these populations of milkweeds are remaining stable over time, decreasing or increasing, depending on the type of management that the Department of Transportation uses along these spaces. And all of this comes back to the nationwide candidate conservation agreement for the North American monarch. This is a mouthful, but what it ultimately is, is an agreement between the US Fish and Wildlife Service and energy and transportation providers to ensure that they manage a subsection of the habitat that they regularly manage for the conservation of the monarch butterfly, providing resources of nectar to support the migration, as well as breeding habitat to support year round or seasonal breeding of the monarch butterfly. And if you can see uh, in the multitude of logos, the Florida Department of Transportation is indeed a member of this agreement. So I'm very pleased to say that they are on board for doing what they can in support of monarch conservation right here in the Sunshine State. And then we're also working with the Department of Transportation on another pilot project. So if you drive along a Florida roadway, you'll not only see the road verge, but you may see 
retention basins a little farther off in the distance. And these are either wet or dry stormwater retention basins. And all new roadways and many existing roadways have excessive numbers of retention basins. And these are often off the radar when it comes to viable conservation spaces. So in many ways, they're like a black box for conservation. And so we see these as really viable habitat to rebuild or augment pollinator habitat. So our project is to look over the course of three years to rebuild pollinator habitat, particularly for the monarch in these spaces, planting both dry adapted and wet adapted milkweed species and a variety of other herbaceous native ecotuff flowering plants in support of pollinator conservation and ultimately test a number of different treatments, including using large plants for establishment, using plugs for establishment, and also using seed for establishment and ultimately evaluating which yields the best uh, product for pollinator use and then monitor those habitats for which pollinator species actually visit these augmented spaces and also monitor colonization by the North American monarch and then collectively do a cost analysis so we can report back to the Department of Transportation to what is the best practice to actually augment these spaces in the hopes that they will see great benefit of this and replicate this across Florida and the Southeast overall to help rebuild um, habitat for both monarchs and pollinators. And this has been a really rewarding project. And these are really lovely spaces. Some of them are quite beautiful as you can see with this slide uh, and offer a lot of opportunity uh, to provide resources and true habitat for pollinators. And then of course we work also in a wide range of uh, spaces with an increasingly urban core. And there's been a lot of utility and a lot of research showing that urban spaces, uh, suburban areas and urban green space are really viable for rebuilding habitat for wildlife, connecting people to nature, and particularly for small mobile organisms like insects. However, what we really don't have a good handle on is how the configuration of these green spaces, the plant composition, and ultimately the landscape design factor in to, being, uh, to building out best practices that provide the best impact for these small spaces for the insect community writ large. So we are really curious about a number of these questions. So in this uh, small case study, working with Adam Dale uh, at the Department of Entomology at the University of Florida, we, we asked the question, if you are building a small garden habitat specifically designed for the monarch, how does it matter how you actually design that space? So as an example, if you built out a landscape that had a monoculture of just milkweeds, or you planted a mixed species plot that had a mixture of both larval host plants, milkweeds, and blooming plant species, how would this affect colonization by the monarch and how it also would affect the use by native um, uh, natural uh, biological control agents such as predators and parasitoids. parasitoids. So for this, we, we established monocultures and mixed species plots, compared monarch egg abundance, natural uh, enemy abundance and richness, and ultimately biological control of monarch larvae across both of these treatments. And what we found was actually quite surprising. We found that monarchs actually laid significantly more eggs, not in the monarch milkweed monocultures, but in the milkweed uh, and flowering plant mixed species plots. And that these mixed species plots supported a much higher richness of natural enemies, as well as other predators such as wasps and predatory bugs. But we didn't see the ultimate pest control impacts to monarch butterfly larvae. So the grand result of this is that mixed species plots do both. They support the monarch butterfly more effectively and they support the beneficial insect community more effectively without any contrary negative effect to either population overall. So this shows that plant selection and habitat design, even in really small spaces is important, especially in the context of monarch butterfly conservation. And then we also looked at larger spaces, which include suburban yards and neighborhoods, because we know that pl plant composition and a community composition, including fine scale 
habitat heterogeneity within these urban gardens is really important to influencing community assembly of insects. But the nuance of how that actually happens and what's best practice is still poorly known. So the goal of this project was really to increase our understanding of how suburban landscape factors contribute most to attracting insects, particularly flower visiting insects in order to give homeowners kind of best practice for making subtle but impactful landscape decisions within their own landscapes. So we assess such variables as uh, distance to nearest green space, area of the yard itself, the plant richness of the yard, plant type and plant species richness of those landscapes, bloom abundance, and we also passively collected the insects that were attracted to those landscape spaces. And what we found is really kind of three things. One is that bloom abundance was really a significant driver. So the more blooms that you have in your landscapes, the more insects you attracted. Plant diversity was also really important. The more plant diversity you had, uh, significantly increased the number of flower visiting insects that your yard attracted. However, what we found as a third variable was somewhat surprising, and that was the evenness of the plant community really modulated those other two variables. It was synergistic and really significantly grew the impact of both bloom abundance and plant diversity. So an even community or an even landscape would be a, a, a landscape that has a, a more even number of individual plants across a limited number of species. So as an example, an uneven landscape would be if you had 100 plants, each representing one of a different species, that would be a very uneven landscape. However, if you had 100 plants of which 10 represent 10 individual species, that's a much more even community. So by making simple changes, by maximizing the blooming plants in your yard, by planting an even selection of species, species this had a much more impactful uh, result to maximizing your insect attraction. Uh, so ultimately, the, the end game here is select species that you know are attractive and maximize their presence in your landscape. And this would be equivalent to creating large drifts of color with one species or two species overall across the entirety of your landscape. So large sort of billboards of color that ultimately are much more impactful from a design perspective and also are impactful from a community attraction perspective. So this just sort of tweaks the landscape and make subtle changes that can have really robust impact. And then two other, or actually three other initiatives we're working on at the University of Florida that have broad potential pollinator benefit. One of these is working with growers like the Florida Association of Native Nurseries and trying to get more high profile pollinator attracting plants to be more widely available in the native plant and commercial market so that homeowners can find them more readily and incorporate them into their landscape. The second is a new project we have, which is the development of a wildlife friendly plant certification program at the University of Florida. And this is hitting it on two sides. One is to actually evaluate commercially available plants to see which species of insects they attract more readily. So that as an example, if you were looking at butterfly attracting plants, versus bee attracting plants, we would have the data to ultimately tell you which plants are better for each particular target group. And then we're also evaluating the chemical inputs that go in during production to ensure that those plants are ultimately, when they're available for sale, are safe for the insects we, that we want to attract in our landscapes. Because we know that a lot of chemicals, including systemic insecticides, are used in production that can have very, very uh, deleterious effects to the very organisms we want to attract. So we're trying to hit this from both sides to ensure that they're vetted for pollinator attraction and also are safe for the wildlife that we want to attract. And then the third is really developing a training program for master gardeners, extension agents, and landscape maintenance professionals in integrated pest and pollinator management. So if you create a landscape or you have somebody come in to manage a landscape in your yard or neighborhood, that everyone knows how to effectively manage this somewhat diverse landscape 
that's very different than a, convention, a conventional landscape uh, in a safe, effective, sustainable way for wildlife overall. So collectively, I think these will have really big impact moving forward to ensure that we can create viable green spaces for wildlife, including pollinators, and ultimately manage them long-term in a much more sustainable manner. And so that's kind of the big picture. And now I wanna segue in the time I have left to two examples, one bee and one butterfly example of projects that we're working on that are particularly successful when they come to pollinator conservation. And many of you may have seen this butterfly in the media or uh, online, and this is Shouse's swallowtail. This is a very large charismatic butterfly. It was originally described in early the early 1900s from around the Miami-Dade area. It's endemic to Florida. It's today our only federally endangered swallowtail within the United States, and it's a hardwood hammock specialist in South Florida. So it has all that cachet value, just a glorious butterfly, really special unique habitat. It acts as an umbrella for so many other uh, species and is kind of an icon for this globally imperiled system of tropical hardwood hammock. It, it, it is restrictive to this dense sort of subtropical understory uh, where the larvae feed on two uh, citrus family plants, sea torchwood and wild lime. Uh, and it has a single large spring flight and a, there's evidence for a second late season flight in late summer and early fall. Uh, and it's really uh, kind of a desert adapted species because it comes out in spring at the onset of the rainy season when uh, the rains trigger a proliferation of new growth on the host, which the larvae need in order to complete development. And it right now only occurs in Southeast Florida, only within conservation lands, within the lands of Biscayne National Park, Crocodile Lake National Wildlife Refuge, John Penny Camp Coral Reef State Park, and Dagny Johnson Key Largo Hammock Botanical State Park. Great park, horrible long name, but these are all wonderful places in South Florida where you can see this butterfly right now. And what we've been doing over the last several decades is going down on an annual basis and surveying this butterfly to understand what is the population level trajectory. We capture individuals, we tag them, we release them, we recapture them and understand kind of where they move, what are the population densities, you know, how are they doing from year to year over time. And these are very challenging environments that are heavily infested with mosquitoes because they do not spray adulticides because these are protected land areas. So ultimately you have to wear mosquito gear. And if you don't wear mosquito gear, this is generally what you uh, encounter, thousands and thousands of salt marsh mosquitoes. And over time, this butterfly has had a fairly volatile history um, if you look at this graph, which shows kind of from year to year, the population fluctuation, you'll see a couple of things. You'll see one thing highlighted with a star, and that was the impact of Hurricane Andrew into Southeast Florida, which really depressed the population. You'll see a rebound in the, in the middle 1990s, owing to organism re reintroductions. And then you see kind of a cascade downward in the early 2000s to the late uh, 2010s. And this is a point where uh, funding kind of fell off and annual surveys kind of also trickled downward. And in 2012, at the result of the first range-wide population survey across agencies, we recorded only four individuals remaining in the wild. So this was really a wake-up call. This butterfly was literally teetering on the brink of extinction at this point. Only four individuals remaining in the wild. That's catastrophically low. And we were really thinking we're watching an extinction event happen. So this triggered a number of things. It triggered an, an emergency rule to allow us to bring this butterfly into captivity at the University of Florida. And these are views from my lab at the Florida Museum of Natural History. Luckily, we have a lot of experience working with this butterfly and it's a very productive butterfly. It adapts well to captive environments. And you can see that you know females can lay a lot of eggs. Those eggs on the left-hand side are just from one female. One female can lay north of uh, about 500 eggs in her lifetime. And that these are very large, very showy larvae. The one pictured on the right-hand side shows those fleshy white uh, projections called osmeteria, which all papillionid or swallowtail larvae have. So it, it's, a, it's a butterfly that adapts well to captivity. And we, um, 
we grow it uh, and we grow individual larvae in isolated cups to prevent disease transmission and ultimately use these for wild reintroductions across the historic range of this butterfly. And we reintroduce butterflies at multiple life stages, larvae, pupae, and adults. And in this slide, you see Matt Standridge from my lab releasing a second instar larva within Biscayne National Park using a, a camel hair uh, paintbrush. And then we also release uh, adult organisms. And where possible, we try to involve our stakeholders. So the picture on the right-hand side is Elsa Alviar. She's a ranger within Biscayne National Park, releasing number 502, a female Shousa swallowtail uh, within northern Key Largo. Um, and this butterfly is also going to be the focus of an upcoming series on National Geographic for America's national parks. The terrestrial story of Biscayne National Park will be told uh, through the lens of our conservation work on this butterfly. And so that is set to air either later in the calendar year of 2022 or early in 2023. So please keep your eyes out for that. We're very excited about the attention that it'll bring to this uh, really uh, unique uh, species within Florida. And then uh, we also, uh, one unique thing about this project is we involve a lot of community scientists, very dedicated individuals. Many of them are retirees and they go tirelessly into these very dense uh, hardwood hammocks during June and August, times of year where it's just amazingly hot and wet and humid and just thousands and thousands of mosquitoes. So these are really intrepid individuals and they are really key to us having good evaluations from year to year of the population trajectory of these butterflies. So this is a perfect example of how community scientists and conservation of really rare organisms can go hand in hand. So these are highly trained individuals that do a lot of good. So this now comes to the success story of this project. So over the last eight years or so, we've been working tirelessly with community scientists, with agencies to restore habitat, to reintroduce organisms, to monitor it. And going from that four individuals in 2012 Last year, we had the best year this butterfly has ever seen in its documented history with over 1,700 individuals reported. So this trend line going northward is the right trajectory. And we're, we're hoping that this trend continues over time. But we've taken this butterfly from the brink of extinction to now being a fairly stable population uh, within the areas in which it's extant. So I'm really, really proud of this. And there are so many wonderful collaborators that have made this happen. And then the second story of this butterfly is the fact that now we are reintroducing it into unoccupied areas within South Florida and the Florida Keys. So this picture of me releasing an adult individual, this is on Lignavite Key Botanical State Park in the lower Florida Keys, an area that has never had an extant population of butterflies after the 1950s. And so we are restoring that butterfly to this previously unoccupied area. And I'm happy to report that last year, owing to our reintroductions, this was the first female butterfly seen in the wild at that location from our reintroductions. And again, I can thank a lot of biologists, a, a lot of our intrepid citizen scientists that go in the field to help monitor. And this photo was actually taken by Susan Coulterman, one of our just super volunteers in the field uh, to really document the success of our reintroduction efforts. So again, all is, is going well with this butterfly overall. And then the last kind of <laughs> 10 or 15 minutes I have, I wanna talk about another success story uh, with this little tiny bee called the blue Kalamintha bee. This is a, a little bee that probably nobody has heard of before we really started working on it. This is a, a little bee that when we started working on it was known from only four uh, isolated extant populations along the central uh, uh, Florida Ridge down around Hillsborough County. So this was an ultra rare bee that we didn't even know if it was still extant within Florida. And so we were lucky enough to get a state wildlife grant to, <laughs> to investigate this, uh, this bee and really determine what was the current status of it, 
where was it currently distributed uh, across Florida and try to piece together bits of knowledge about its ecology, its life history, its floral use uh, across that range and ultimately evaluate how vulnerable was this bee uh, to future climate change and future global change within Florida. And going into this project, we didn't even know if we would actually be able to find this bee still existing in Florida. So this was uh, a really um, unique project. However, we were very fortunate and indeed we did find the bee and it is a floral specialist of this plant called Ashes Calumet, which is a, a really unique scrub plant uh, that's widespread across Florida scrub from about Hillsborough County in the south northward uh, up into uh, south central Georgia. And this little tiny bee, which is only about a centimeter in length, uh, is uh, really challenging to find. It has a really unique behavior when it visits a blossom. It actually collects the pollen on its forehead. So it, it bobs its head back and forth at a blossom uh, to collect the pollen and then transfers that pollen from its forehead to the underside of its abdomen to take back to its nest to ultimately um, uh, partition or to ultimately um, uh, build a ball of pollen to lay an egg on to uh, uh, build out a nest uh, moving forward. And this is kind of the habitat uh, that it exists in. This is kind of deep uh, sugar sand scrub in Hillsborough County. But this slide also shows the reason this bee is so rare. And so you have on one side, the right hand side, beautiful rare Florida scrub on the left-hand side, citrus and heavy agriculture. And so this bee exists at the intersection of heavily developed agriculture and wild lands. And the fact that it has lost a lot of habitat over time. So now it's incredibly fragmented from what the historic range of this bee likely was in Florida. And since we rediscovered this bee uh, in central Florida, it actually was one of the top rated stories run by the Florida Museum of Natural History in, 19, in uh, 2020 and 21, uh, right in the middle of the pandemic. So I don't know if this was an artifact of the pandemic, that people wanted good news, or just the fact that a rare blue bee was sort of the uh, unique uh, search uh, string for most people, but it generated a lot of attention from CNN and Discover Magazine to CBS News and Garden and Gun Magazine, and just generated uh, sort of millions of eyes on this story, which was really uh, amazing. It, it had a total of 208 global media outlets and stories run, and a potential viewership of north of a, a 250 million uh, viewers. So it was it really caught us by surprise and shows that insects can be indeed very charismatic organisms. And as a result of our efforts, and this is sort of the, the positive takeaway, we, we did a lot of on the ground work. We recorded a lot of uh, plants and monitored a lot of habitat. And ultimately we expanded the range of this bee uh, northward in Florida by almost 220 kilometers from the south portion of the Florida uh, Lake Wells Ridge up to Ocala National Forest and several conservation lands in, be in between. So it's still an ultra rare bee, but we know a lot more about it now. We, we have it greatly extended the range and the fact that we are now working with a lot of landowners to try to understand how management ultimately affects this bee so that we can maintain these populations as viable and extant moving forward. And through this process, we've also developed unique little techniques uh, for monitoring bees. And this is one where uh, my postdoc, Chase Kimmel, pictured in the lower right-hand side, uses these little plastic bags to safely and temporarily capture bees uh, and ultimately be able to photograph them uh, and in the case of this bee, we actually need to get photographs of the head of the bee because that's where some of the diagnostic features actually exist. But this is also a great way for just community scientists to safely handle a bee in the wild. We can also collect genetic uh, tissue samples. We can also, as you might see in the left-hand portion of the slide, collect pollen off the bee for later identification. So it's just a great little technique that works well in the field to safely 
and securely capture any bee, including those of conservation concern, concern and collect a lot of data with one individual specimen. And then we're moving forward to work with uh, a number of land managers, including utility uh, transmission uh, rights away to help restore habitat for this butterfly. And so on the right hand side of this slide, you see an existing Duke energy right away within Ocala National Forest that maintains really great habitat. On the right hand side is a right away that not so much great habitat for the bee. So how can we enhance these landscapes that not only benefit this bee, but more broadly pollinators and the monarch butterfly more broadly across many of these landscapes. And so that's the goal moving forward is to try to rebuild habitat for this bee uh, and provide resources to keep this bee ultimately viable and extant within Florida. And then I'll end by saying that another success story and Wendy can attest to this, which I'm very, very proud of is the fact that you never know where collaborations will lead you and how inspiration can take a unique turn. So. I'm a beer drinker. I love beer. I'll be perfectly honest about that. And so we reached out to First Magnitude Brewing in Gainesville to say, hey, would you like to have a collaboration that might be really unique? How would you like to develop beers that aid conservation and theme them after really rare uh, endemic or uh, Florida-based species, such as the Monarch or Miami Blue or Bartram Scrub Hair Streak? And they said, well, that's a really unique idea. Let's try it. And so that started about five years ago. And today we're up to our 12th butterfly beer. And with each beer, we try to actually push the envelope a little bit, including trying to get the butterfly physically in the beer. So the headline from Food and Wine, this is probably the first conservation story ever being featured in Food and Wine, is we actually went into the field and swabbed the butterfly and used the yeast from the butterfly in the brewing process to... Um, really truly put the butterfly in the beer for this butterfly called the frosted elephant. And with each beer, again, we keep pushing the envelope. So this is our latest uh, incarnation. It's a national initiative. The theme or the initiative is called Restore the Reign of the Monarch. It's an imperial stout and we're partnering with the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation and reaching out to craft breweries across the US to come on board we provide the beer recipe and the label graphics. They sign on and with signing on, they provide a portion of the proceeds that funnel into the Xerxes Society to rebuild monarch habitat across North America. So in my mind, this is a win-win, drink a beer, save a butterfly, have a fun social experience and really benefit conservation. And it's really shown to me that conservation is a social enterprise that we can no longer rely on simple ways or traditional models for kind of connecting people to nature and building out conservation. And this has been really, really rewarding for me overall. And lastly, just a, 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 a plug as when you mentioned, I'm, I'm an author. And so these are several of my books, including the most recent, which is the second edition to your Florida guide to butterfly gardening, which is available now. So uh, just saying these are available if you so cho chose to uh, want to uh, uh, look at the resources that uh, I have provided. And then with that, I'll just say thank you and be happy to answer any questions that you have and, and just make the caveat that all the work that you have seen is uh, really done in collaboration to a lot of really hardworking people in my lab and across many, many different agencies and organizations. Community conservation is truly community conservation. So with that, I'll say thank you and be happy to answer any questions. Oh, Jared, that was just fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have some good questions and I will go ahead and, and toss those to you right now. Um, Joan wants to know, is there a UF listing of partner pollinator plants for target crops? And I think this was generated by the uh, wildflowers next to the uh, squash planting. So we, so we do have an, an EDIS document uh, that talks about wildflower establishments adjacent to agriculture. And that would really be the same for if you had a large property, you want to plant a wildflower meadow for, uh, for um, benefiting pollinators. So that is on EDIS um, as a PDF. Um, and I believe it's like wildflower augmentation for Florida agriculture. Great. 
great. Um, John Ignash is wondering how light, light pollution is impacting insects, um, especially pollinators. That's a, that's a great question. And it's, it's, there's a lot more research into light pollution uh, over the last several years, and it's shown to be a very significant uh, driver of decline, particularly in urbanized areas of insects overall, but also pollinators. And there was a recent study that also showed that it's actually affecting how monarch butterflies develop and actually migrate. So it's, it's having impact not only on the community and decline of that community, but on the behavior of organisms themselves. So it's a, it's a huge concern with increasing urban development. Um, and then some questions about the mowing of the wildflowers on the roadsides. Um, the main point, wondering how uh, FDOT is receiving this information and are they changing their practices? So that's an ongoing um, discussion with the Department of Transportation. I will say that they're, they're very motivated by their agreement uh, with uh, the Canada Conservation uh, Agreement with the Monarch. So they're, they have agreed to set aside, I believe it's about 10% of their land for monarch habitat, and that's generally floral resources. So they're looking to manage that landscape uh, more effectively for monarch conservation. And that's of course, just general pollinator uh, resources available, uh, but they're not a conservation organization. They're a safety organization. And so, you know, it's an ongoing dialogue. We, we they know that mowing somewhat less is gonna be more beneficial. It's just finding what is gonna be workable for them. And it's a complicated story because they also out contract a lot of that mowing. They don't yes. do it a lot themselves. So right. these are complicated contracts and complicated dialogues, yeah. but they are moving in the right direction. Good. Well, it always seems when I want to go out and butterfly watch and look for wildflowers, they've just mowed. So I'm sure you've had that experience as well. Um, and then um, we have someone wondering about the seeing all the wonderful eggs of the schwa swallowtail, wondering uh, what is the percentage of the eggs making it to adulthood in the laboratory setting? That's a great question. So on average, we have about a 70 to 75 percent success rate uh, from egg to adult in the lab. So much more than it would be out in the wild because it's under control conditions. And, uh, you know, one female butterfly can be incredibly productive under captive uh, situations. So we try to maximize that productivity. And I'm really lucky to have really wonderful trained people in my lab. So they take really, really good care. And, you know, Wendy will attest to this that because you're dealing with living organisms, it's not like you can take a weekend off and just no. leave the lab. It's 24 seven care. No. And I think a lot of master gardeners have babysat caterpillars for each other also. <laughs> um, uh, Maria is wondering, uh, butter, can butterfly houses help to support butterflies? Um, you know, is, how is that, how is that effect in, in the community or in community gardens? Is, is there any effect at all? Are you talking butterfly houses like the ones in your garden or think, like display um, industry butterfly houses? I think houses? they just like vivariums or something of that effect. Uh, so, uh, so they do provide a lot of monetary resources back to the country where the butterflies actually are bred and come from. Uh, and that supports a lot of families. It's a very gender equity uh, industry. It is a, a, a non-destructive um, extractive resource that helps keep forested systems in place. It doesn't do a lot in the, in the U.S. for butterfly conservation, but in tropical forest countries, it can be quite uh, helpful uh, for forest conservation overall. Okay. Um, that was kind of an interesting question. The, um, the other question is about the diversity in the home landscape with the even number of plants. And I think people are getting caught up on that word even. I think you mean also mean balanced number of plants. Yeah, so evenness is an ecological term and, and it's just the, the proportion of individual species versus representation in the landscape. So, you know, like again, if you had, you know, 10 species in your yard, one of each would be fairly uneven. If you had larger numbers of each species, 
uh, overall. It's it's a more balanced community. And so you're basically, the, the basic recommendations are pick species that you know are attractive and that you like and maximize their representation in the landscape. Don't take the kid in the candy store approach of buying one of every species that you see and plant them in your yard, that the bigger bang for the buck is in you know, more plants of the same species that are good. And this is probably due to the fact that insects are visually uh, searching insects. They're like humans. They're drawn to these waves of color versus kind of the polka dot uh, Monet kind of approach in the landscaper. Um, Karen's wondering if, uh, have you ever involved Disney conservation? Yeah, so we, we have a, a global initiative with, with Disney right now. We're one of 10 in, uh, organizations funded for a decade long initiative called Saving Wildlife. And so with that initiative, we work on about 42 imperiled butterflies in Florida and California and a few other states. And so um, a lot of the work that we do is funded uh, in part or all by the Disney Conservation Fund. So they are wow. a media company, but a really a good conservation company overall. Yeah. There's a real untold story there with Disney conservation. Um, Kira is wondering, are there any wasp or predator, other predatory species that are specific to a certain species of butterfly? So um, predators are gonna be generally more generalistic. Okay. There are some parasitoids that will seek out either certain species or certain life stages of certain species. Um, as an example, many of you may have heard of trichogramma wasps. These are egg parasites that often go for, you know, large abundant uh, densities of eggs like lepidopteran eggs. So it really depends, you know, insects are in a multitude of generalists and specialists. And so it really depends. Uh, but there, there are a lot of predators and parasitoids for lepidoptera within your home landscape that are, you know, seeking to make them uh, a food for, for themselves or their developing brood. Great. Um, and then um, folks are wondering if you're generally seeing less butterflies this year, uh, specifically in Hernando, Hernando County. Uh, that's a hard question to answer. So um, <laughs> from year to year, you know, the numbers do vacillate just with weather and other impacts. I, I think, you know, the general trend that I've heard from most people, including my, my own observations that over the last decade or so, we've seen more, uh, we've seen fewer butterflies generally across a lot of landscapes, right? We're, we're losing habitat we're, and therefore we're losing populations and losing some species. And so we don't see as many butterflies now as I did when I was young. And that's kind of the common trend, but for individual locations, I think that vacillates broadly by rainfall patterns, by what's happening in the surrounding environment from year to year. And so I, I wouldn't take individual month or year data and say, you know, it, it's one data point, it does not make a trend. Right, okay, very good. Um, someone was wondering if, they, if you think that the ashes calmintha is available out in the, from native nurseries or anything like that. It, I have seen it at a few nurseries, um, including Green Isle Nursery down in um, Central Florida, uh, Mark Grove, Gott's Grove facility. Land, yeah, Mark yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, but, but, you know, it's a very specialist plan for deep sand. It's a scrub specialist. So, mm -hmm. you know, be mindful again of the, those tenants of, you know, right, right plant, right place kind of in the landscape that it's not going to do well in richer soil. It's going to really need you know, dry, deep sand to be successful. It, but it is a fantastic pollinator attracting plant. And it's, it's really a woody plant. It's a shrub, it's a sub shrub, really. I'd like to give it a try. Um, the One of the tours that the Master Gardener Conference is gonna do is to Bach Tower. And I know they have a lot of endangered plants there. They do, and plant. they probably do have ashes yeah. it as well. And it, it is a, it has been used in some areas for restoration in Central Florida. Great. Um, there's a couple more comments. Uh, one is, uh, Jared, if you get a heads up when the National Geographic show is going to air, if you can get that to me, I would like to get it out to the Master Gardeners. Yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah, we, we, they're we're asking about that. That'll be fun. Um, number two um, is, um, I'm 
if I can, I will bring some of the first magnitude butterfly beer to um, the auction at the Master Gardener Conference because you can really only get it um, at, in Gainesville. So I can bring a six pack or a growler of that down. Well, and, um, and I'll be happy to donate a few glasses with you okay. for, for that event too. Good. I, I have two Miami blue glasses. I'm not really ready to um, let go of those quite yet. And then the last thing, uh, Jarrett, before we go, remind us the title of your new book. And I want to remind everybody that um, Jarrett will be at the Master Gardener Conference in October um, speaking on these, these kind of things and more. So Jarrett, what's your new title? So it's your Florida guide to butterfly gardening, a guide for the deep South. And it's a second edition. It's available from the University Press of Florida. Great, very good. Thank you all. I notice I've got some other questions in there, but we're gonna let those ride um, and I will, uh, I'll actually send them to you, Jared. So we really appreciate okay. you being with us today. Remember that this is recorded and this will be up on the Master Gardener website very soon. And so if you wanted to share it with friends or other Master Gardeners, you're more than welcome to do that. So thank you all. And Jared, thank you for your conservation efforts. The chat box was full of people just singing your praise and we we're just so happy. And I said to Emily, I'm not crying, you're crying because because we're just so moved by the work that you've done. So thank um, you so much. Well, thanks, thanks to all of you. And you know, Master Gardeners really do make the world go round. So you're very important <laughs> to the community and connecting people to nature. So thanks for everything that you all do. Wonderful. Thank you all. Bye-bye.